Hello everybody, my name is Raul, a critical care nurse for about 23 years and 22 of those years were taking care of open heart surgery and that's what I'm, patients, so that's what I'm going to talk to you today. So, if you're watching this video, it's because either someone said the word cabbage, bypass, open heart, one of those words either told you that you need that surgery or maybe they told your loved one, your spouse, your child, your parent, um, whomever needs one. Uh, or maybe you're just a student or someone trying to report and you need more information. Either way, I promise I'm going to break it down for you. I'm going to make it real simple. You will understand. And I hopefully I'll be able to take away a lot of the scariness from it. Okay? Um, so, open heart surgery. Yes, it's a big deal. Uh, yes, the outcomes from today's surgeries are really good. So know that going in. Now, what does it mean? Well, let me break it down for you. I'm going to make it real simple. Let's talk about your heart, okay? Most important muscle of the body, right? The heart. Now, what does it actually do? Well, we know it pumps, right? And it pumps blood. Think of blood as nutrition. It's got nutrients. It's got oxygen. Basically, what happens is every time the heart pumps, it shunts blood to all parts of the body. It feeds the body all the way from the tips of your toes to the top of your head, your brain, your legs, it feeds everything, right? Because the body's got to eat. But the heart's got to eat too. So what happens is there's also these arteries that come off the heart and they go right back on the heart. So they can feed itself. Very important, right? Um, but what happens when those arteries, and there's several of them, what happens when those arteries become blocked? And they become can block because of plaque, of sometimes blood clots, can, uh, can cause those occlusions. There's a lot of risk factors in a person that can cause that, and sometimes it's just hereditary. We know the smoking can increase that, obesity can increase that, uh, uh, a hard lifestyle, uh, stress, and sometimes just bad luck, you got the genes, right? Okay, so I'll think about this. I'm gonna paint you a picture, okay? So you can follow me. Um, you need to eat, right? And if you don't eat, it's been several hours, you start to get hungry. What does hunger feel like to you? Right? Your stomach starts to hurt, you feel like cramps, you, you feel uneasy, right? Well, that's how the heart feels. If it's not getting enough oxygen, it starts to go through hunger pains. What do those feel like? It feels like chest pain. It feels like pain that's radiating to your back, down your left arm, up your jaw. It feels like you get diaphoretic. Or it could feel like you're just a little bit short of breath, right? There's a lot of symptoms that it could be. But think of chest pain as hunger pain. Your heart's telling your body, hey, I'm hungry. I need food, I'm not getting food, because that artery that's feeding that part of the heart is blocked, okay? Now, today, today uh, you go to the emergency room with chest pain, they'll often take you to cath lab, where they'll take a quick look, they'll put a, a like a large IV in your groin, a little wire, they'll guide it up close to the heart, they'll shoot some dye, take x-rays, and boom, they'll be able to see the blockage. And a lot of times, with that procedure, they're able to open up. They do what's called an angioplasty and a stent, what basically that means is they'll be able to open up, right? But sometimes they can't. Sometimes they have to go in the old fashioned way, the big way. And that's what's called open heart surgery. Cabbage, C-A-B-G, coronary artery bypass graft. So what does that mean? Okay, I want you to picture this. Uh, picture that you're on the freeway and all of a sudden a, a big rig overturns and it's blocking every single lane traffic is completely backed up okay that is what's happening in your artery there's a little occlusion and the blood flow can't go through all right so we've got to fix that so what do the what what do they do well imagine if in five hours time um someone comes construction company comes right and they start building a bridge over the accident site Okay, so now cars are driving and they go over the accident and then they continue on their merry way. That's, that's, what's, that's called a bypass. They just created a bypass over the accident so that the cars can continue. That's the same thing with your arteries. They'll come in and they'll take either an artery or a vein, they'll connect it before the blockage, right? They'll connect it before the blockage and then they'll connect it after the blockage. Pretend my watch is the blockage, right? Blood can't flow anymore. So what they'll do is they'll connect the vein here here and then also blood flows that's what's called a bypass 
And that's what they want to do. So when you hear them say, oh, how many bypasses? I had five or three or two. That means that those number of, of arteries, heart arteries were blocked and they had to go in. Now, where do they get those arteries or veins to create the bypass? Well, the heart has a mammary one, which is like an artery on itself that it doesn't really use. Some, they'll always try to use that one. Um, we also have a large vein graft in our leg, and that's why they cut your leg, is to take out that long vein. They'll cut it into pieces, and they'll usually use that to do that. So when you have open heart surgery, they are going to cut your chest open. They're also either going to cut your leg or your arm. Sometimes they harvest it from an artery that are, uh, in your, your arm, okay? Now, so how long is that surgery? Uh, it's going to depend. Um, I've seen doctors do it in three and a half hours. I've seen them take 12 hours. Depends on the person, you know. Uh, uh, open heart is not open heart is not open heart. Everyone's different, they go in differently, so it could take a lot of, uh, there's a lot of factors to consider. Typically about four hours to do three or four grafts, typically, um, but it varies. So what happens after the doctor's finished? When the doctor is finished, they bring the patient to an ICU, a critical care, a cardiovascular ICU or a regular ICU or a medical ICU, it depends on the hospital they, that they're having it in. The room looks very similar to this one. You have your monitors, your leads. Yeah, your loved one or yourself is gonna be hooked up to a lot of wires and cables. It looks a little scary and it looks like a lot, but I promise you that your nurse knows what everything means. To them, this is normal and they're able to absorb it and they'll be taking good care of you. Okay, so you'll be hooked up to a monitor, uh, lots of leads. Um, you'll be hooked up to a respirator, a big machine. I know it looks scary, but hopefully it won't be on. You won't be connected more than a couple of hours. Sometimes there's some facilities that as soon as you arrive into ICU, even before you arrive in ICU, they actually take you off the breathing machine. When you're on the breathing machine, you may wake up and find that tube in your mouth. That's what happens most of the time. Just know that you can't talk. You may try to talk. The machine's gonna alarm, you're gonna hear all those noise, but you won't be able to talk. Once that tube's out, you will be able to talk. And there's a process in getting that off. They don't wanna hurry up and take that out because they wanna make sure you're nice and awake. See, they give you all these drugs and surgery to really knock you out, right? And we kinda of wake up, but we kinda of don't afterwards right away, uh, which means we're not able to take these big deep breaths. So what happens is a lot of times people think they're awake, but then they'll fall back asleep. That's no good to us. You have to be awake, awake before we take that tube out because the tube is helping you breathe. And if you're too asleep, you kind of don't take deep enough breaths. Okay, enough said. So it varies sometimes right away, sometimes an hour, two hours, three hours, but once you're awake, they'll remove the tube. Once the tube is removed, you will be able to talk, okay? Um, you'll also have a, a one to two other tubes that go into your chest. These are called chest tubes. Um, why do you have chest tubes? Well, they just did surgery inside your chest and you're gonna be oozing inside a little bit, right? They don't want that blood to build up in there because it creates pressure. So these tubes are drains. They're just big drains. They're gonna come out usually right here under the middle stem and they're gonna drive into what's called the pleurovac. It's just like, a, think of a big jar. It's a flat square, big jar. It's gonna drain into that, okay? They'll be watching. You'll hear bubbly noise, blah, 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 blah. There's water in that. It's just part of the suction, don't worry about it. One to two days is usually what it lasts, and then they'll take it out. Um, the doctor will take out those tubes, suture you up, okay? So expect that. You'll have a Foley catheter, what is that? Well, that's a, that's a catheter that goes in your urethra where it helps you pee, so you don't have to worry about peeing. Um, hopefully the next day um, they'll be able to take that out, okay? So if you're a loved one and you walk in, just know that it's gonna be a room like this and you won't hardly be able to see your loved one because they're gonna be under a lot of wires, cables, tubes, and stuff like that. But I tell you what, this is my favorite part. Um, I'll, I'll get a patient from surgery. They just had open heart and of course they're all swollen from the fluid. They've got tubes coming out of everywhere and the family's real concerned. They're, they don't like the way they look, it's scary, right? I always assure him that he's fine or she's fine or I tell him the truth, whatever the situation is. And then most of the time, um, they we, we send the family home that day because um, they really can't be sitting around next to the patient when uh, fresh off of surgery because what happens is the patient gets kind of excited when they have family members, they try to talk and it creates a lot of stress on the patient. So usually what we explain is, uh, you know, 
I want you to see him. I want you to know he's okay, that he's alive. Then I want you to go home and get some sleep. Because what happens is the day before, neither the patient or the family gets much rest. They're nervous, they're anxious, and they usually have to get up real early to arrive to the hospital for the procedure if they're coming in, right? So I like to send them home and say, hey, here's the number. Call me, check up on me. I will update them uh, when they call. So they go home and sleep, okay? Meanwhile, what are we doing here in the hospital? We're taking, you know, we're allowing him to wake up. We're fine tuning him. We have some medications to help with blood pressure, heart rate, make sure they have plenty of fluid. We have a lot of lines that we read that really tells us what's going on. It's like fine tuning and slowly, slowly, um, hoping that the patient does most of the work and we're doing less fine tuning, okay? So nighttime comes, right? The night nurse starts taking them. Hopefully by that time, they've been off the respirator and they're doing well. When morning comes, usually about, you know, if, if I, when I was working nights, by five or six o'clock in the morning, I would get the patient bathed and things would be going so well. I talked to the doctor, I'd give him a full report and the doctor would usually say, sounds good, get them ready for the day, get them going, pull everything out. So I get to pull out the, the, you have a large catheter in your neck, usually a swan gans is called, that goes in there. I'm able to pull out all the cables, pull out the swan gans, uh, remove a lot of stuff, hopefully the Foley catheter, and then get you up for breakfast. Okay, think about this. You just went in the day before to have open heart surgery. Your family came in, they saw you, you're tied to all these tubes and stuff. They go home and sleep. When they come in, they see you sitting up in the chair, having breakfast, probably holding a pillow because your chest hurts a little bit, right? And you're able to smile at them. They can't believe it. They are they just cannot believe that you're the same person just so many hours later. I, I love that part. I love seeing the family come in and then light up because when they see them, they know that they did well in the surgery and they're happy. Um, speaking of pillows, if you're the patient or a family member, one of the most important things that you got to know is you got to cough and deep breathe after surgery. Yeah, it's easy to cough and deep breathe when you haven't had your chest split open. But once you've had surgery, every time you take a deep breath, it hurts. But you gotta take a deep breath because if you don't take a deep breath, you take all these shallow breath, secretions can build up and that leads to pneumonia. That's just a complication. That's more days in the hospital and God knows what, you don't want that. I know it hurts. Cough and deep breathe. Do not be afraid to ask for medication. Now, if too much bad medication makes you way too sleepy, we may cut back on it for you because I've got to have you cough and deep breathe. i got to have you out of bed the next day walking, ambulating in the hallways because the sooner you're up and about, the less complications and the faster you're going to heal. Okay, The chest hurts a lot. Of course it does. But you know what I find is that most patients tell me two or three days later um, that the worst pain is not actually the chest anymore. It's the leg. It just hurts. It takes a little longer. But it's fine. It'll be fine. It does scar. Um, you'll have a, a three, usually three scars, a scar down the chest, then underneath that you might have a little scar where the chest tubes came in, and then wherever they took your, your, uh, your extra vein, if it's out of the leg or if it's out of the arm. Um, okay, take really good care of it. Try not to stretch that area so much. They tend to keloid, and you don't like when it's keloid. Keloid kind of gets ugly, kind of gets raised and stuff. So you want to uh, follow your doctor's orders, but usually when you get home, you don't have any more dressings and stuff. I usually tell people, once you don't have any more dressings and stuff, you can apply some good scar gel. Um, like the one I recommend is premium scar gel from Healing Touch, it's not on Amazon. I'll put a little box in there so you can check it out. Apply that twice a day, it usually gives you the best results, okay? Uh, that's about the scar. Now, um, they're gonna give you what's called an IS, incentive spirometer. Um, that helps you with the coughing and the deep breathing, okay? It's a little device. I don't have one here. I wish I had one here. I would show it to you. A little device that's got like a little... It's like a little tube that you put in your mouth. Everybody wants to blow. No, 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 you don't blow. You suck. And it's not real easy. I mean, okay, if you do it before surgery, you'll be able to suck up, I don't know, four liters, something like 4,000. No problem. After surgery... It's like 500, 750, maybe a thousand because of the pain. People are always shocked how little they can uh, breathe in afterwards, but you gotta do it. You gotta do it. It's worth it, okay? How long will you stay in the hospital? That varies typically five to seven days, including the day of surgery. If everything goes well, if it goes smooth, then you'll follow up with your doctor usually about a week later. Your life's gonna change. I mean, there's a reason that thing got clogged up in the first place. You wanna avoid that. So your lifestyle is going to change and it's going to be 
for the good. All right. So I know there's a lot more I can cover, but I sure don't want to go over 15 minutes. But if you have any questions, please, please feel free to post them. Um, I'll check it pretty frequently and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. But as always, a big disclaimer, and there's a reason there's this disclaimer, because it's true. Your doctor knows you better than I know you. He's examined you. He's seen you. If you've already had the surgery, he's been inside you. He knows you. Listen to what your doctor says. Tells you, okay? He knows you better than me. This is Raul. Hopefully, I've been able to help you. Hopefully, I've been able to serve you. Bye.